Hi, my name is Louis Pacone, and I'm here to do a presentation on the importance of being Grover Cleveland. Now, this was a presentation that I was planning to give uh, on March 16th at Rosen Library to help kick off Grover Cleveland Week. Now, this is the first ever Grover Cleveland Week that was proclaimed by the state of New Jersey. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the presentation, the opening ceremonies, as well as unfortunately all of the other events that were planned to be held during Grover Cleveland Week were canceled due to the coronavirus. So, I figured, with the help of my director's son, Vincent, that I would do the presentation, but instead of doing it at Roseland Library, I am doing it right here in my home in what I like to call the Louis L. Pacone Presidential Library. So let me take one quick minute before getting into the presentation, and I will give you a brief tour of the Lewis L. Bacone Presidential Library. Now, these are all of my books about the presidents. They start with George Washington and uh, work its way all the way up to my books about Donald Trump over there. Uh, I have some of my presidential memorabilia around here. I have my presidential bobbleheads. I have... Uh, Two letters that I've received uh, from President Bush's, President George W. Bush and President George H. W. Bush. Uh, several years ago, I sent them books, and they were kind enough to send me back letters uh, to thank me. Also, on my research and on my travels, uh, me and my family got to meet President Jimmy Carter in Plains, Georgia. This was actually Easter Sunday, so we got this nice photograph with him. I sent it to him, along with the book and he sent it back to me autographed. So, very special item in my collection. Here I have President Clinton and President Bush sitting side by side, two pals over there. Uh, as well, I also have, oh, gotta point this out, my Grover Cleveland replica $1,000 bill. Now, Grover Cleveland is indeed on the $1,000 bill, but this is just a replica. It's not the real thing. And, uh, and over here we have a very interesting item. This is a sign that was designed to mark the location where President James Garfield was assassinated. Now, President Garfield wasn't assassinated right here in my living room. He was assassinated in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to tell more about the story of how I obtained that marker later on. So first, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I hold a master's in history and also am an adjunct professor in American history at William Patterson University uh, in Wayne, New Jersey. I have written two books about the presidents. My first was Where the Presidents Were Born, The History and Preservation of the Presidential Birthplaces. And my second, which happens to conveniently uh, also be here on my shelf, was The President is Dead. The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. Uh, now, this just came out in paperback about two months ago. Now, I'd mentioned the James Garfield marker. So, after, uh, after this book came out, I had written that James Garfield's uh, assassination site was the only presidential assassination site that isn't marked in any way. Uh, so where Lincoln and McKinley and John F. Kennedy were assassinated, you can find some sort of memorial there. Uh, so after my book came out, I was contacted by the James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio, and they asked me if I would like to be part of a group to help design and write markers for the site where James Garfield was assassinated. Uh, so I was really thrilled to be part of that with some uh, very esteemed uh, historians and National Park Rangers, and uh, it was 2018 that the markers were completed and unveiled in a big ceremony. Uh, now, after that happened, it turns out one of the markers had a typo, so uh, I contacted the National Park Service, and they were nice enough to, instead of throwing out the marker, they gave it to me, and they uh, placed a new marker at the location. I've also spoken about the presidents in several locations. I've spoken at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site. I've spoken at Grover Cleveland's birthplace in Colville, New Jersey. I've spoken at three of George Washington's headquarters in New Jersey, as well as the Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival, uh, where I was also honored 
uh, and thrilled to receive an Ella Dickey Award in 2019. And finally, I've presented uh, at the International Conference U.S. Presidents and Russian Rulers that took place at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow in 2016. After the passing of President George H.W. Bush, I was interviewed by the BBC and by NPR and by Washington Post and New York Times, and uh, it was an honor to be able to speak about his funeral and about his legacy. Uh, and also, uh, more recently, I appeared on the Travel Channel, on the TV show American Mystery, uh, to talk about a mystery surrounding John F. Kennedy's assassination, uh, but I won't go into that any further. Finally, I am a uh, very proud uh, uh, member of the Board of Trustees of the Grover Cleveland Birthplace Memorial Association. That's an organization that was first founded in 1913 to care for the birthplace of President Grover Cleveland, uh, and I joined in 2018. So, it is a great honor for me to help kick off Grover Cleveland Week. Now, Grover Cleveland is a Jersey guy. Uh, in Rawway, New Jersey, uh, there's Grover Cleveland Elementary School. Uh, right in Caldwell, New Jersey, in the town that he was born in, there's also Grover Cleveland Park. And in 2013, Grover Cleveland was elected to the, to the New Jersey Hall of Fame. Uh, it's a little bit sad. It actually took him five years to get inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame, even, uh, even though he was the only president born in New Jersey. Uh, and it only took three years for John Travolta to be elected to the New Jersey Hall of Fame, which means that Vinnie Barbarino got into the Hall of Fame before President Glo uh, Grover Cleveland. But Grover Cleveland did get the ultimate New Jersey honor when a rest stop was named after him on the New Jersey Turnpike. So today you can uh, stop at Roy Rogers and get a Starbucks and fill up your tank at the Grover Cleveland service area. Take that, John Travolta. And now Grover Cleveland has his own week. Uh, now Grover Cleveland is not perfect, uh, but no president is perfect. They're all human. Uh, they're all products of their time. But what I hope to accomplish today in my brief presentation is to tell you about Grover Cleveland so you can learn about his life and learn about his presidency. And I think you will find that Grover Cleveland is a president that citizens of New Jersey and citizens of the United States of America can and should be immensely proud of. Now, Grover Cleveland was born right here in Caldwell, New Jersey. Uh, in a house that I like to say is the only house in America that is the birthplace of not one, but two presidents. Because Grover Cleveland is both our 22nd and our 24th president. I'm going to talk more about that later on, but because of Grover Cleveland, that's why President Donald Trump is our 45th president, but only 44 men have been presidents. So we can thank Grover Cleveland for that little statistical anomaly. Now, Grover Cleveland was born in this house. It was a manse that was first built in 1832, and a manse is a home for the minister of a church. And in this case, it was a minister for the First, Pres uh, for the first Presbyterian Church. Now, the home was built in 1832 for $1,500. Around Christmas time, 1834, the Reverend Foley Cleveland took up residence and... Uh, uh, took up residence in both the home and in the church. On March 18, 1837, the fifth of an eventual nine children was born in this home, Stephen Grover Cleveland. He was born in this room, and he was rocked in this very cradle that you can still see in the home today. Now, the family left the home about 1840. They didn't go very far, though. For a very brief period, they moved in a different home, also in Caldwell. Today, you can go visit that location. It is the Kearney Bank, and uh, unfortunately, there's no marker there uh, to denote the site where President Grover Cleveland lived as a young child, but maybe one day there will be. Later, the family moved to in Fayetteville, New York, and you can go see his home. It's a private residence, so you... Uh, can't really go inside. Uh, but you can also see this nice marker 
where that marks the site where Grover Cleveland lived. Now, in 1853, young Grover Cleveland's life changed forever when his father passed away. Grover, at the age of 15, quit school to care for his family. He went to go work in a grocery store to help support his mother and siblings. At the age of 17, just two years later, Grover Cleveland was a teacher for the New York Institute for the Blind. At 18, Grover Cleveland moved to Buffalo, New York to live with his uncle. And the next year, he was a clerk in a law office. Now, Grover Cleveland studied law, and at the young age of 23, Grover Cleveland was a lawyer and was still sending a portion of his paycheck back home to support his mother and his siblings. At the age of 26, Grover Cleveland was assistant district attorney of Erie County. And just a note on these photographs here, here are two young photographs of Grover Cleveland. Uh, now the one on the right of Grover Cleveland with the beard, that was taken from a website that is called Cool Photos of Presidents When They Were Young and Hunky. And I think Grover Cleveland looks pretty good there. Uh, just a note on the beard, you might have also noticed that I'm sporting my own beard today. Uh, this is not in honor of uh, Grover Cleveland's bearded picture, but uh, since I've been home for the last three weeks, like pretty much everyone else in New Jersey, I decided to forego shaving until the quarantine ends. At the age of 34, Grover Cleveland, very young, was the sheriff of Erie County. Now, not everything was work for Grover Cleveland. Uh, uh, Grover Cleveland liked to enjoy what became his lifelong passion, and that was fishing. In addition, Grover Cleveland liked to go hunting. And if you go to Buffalo today, you can stop by Grover's Bar and Grill, which claims to be a former hunting lodge of President Grover Cleveland. Uh, now, what is definitely is the home of these insanely sized hamburgers that would probably even uh, stuff Grover Cleveland. So a couple years ago, I got to go with my family, and here's a picture of me and my oldest son, Vincent, standing outside of the restaurant. Vincent is currently behind the camera right now, directing this little presentation and doing a great job. In 1882, Grover Cleveland began a meteoric rise in politics. In 1882, he was uh, elected mayor of Buffalo. In 1883, Grover Cleveland was elected governor of New York. And in 1884, Grover Cleveland was the Democratic nominee for president. Now, in the Gilded Age, a time of rampant corruption, uh, both business corruption and political corruption, Grover Cleveland did it the right way. His reputation was of honesty and an anti-corruption crusader. In fact, his nickname was Grover the Good. And his slogan, public office is a public trust. Now also at the time, uh, the New York political machine was run by Tammany Hall. Uh, now Tammany Hall was, uh, was the poster child for Gilded Age corruption as far as political machines. And Grover Cleveland was a reformer that took on Tammany Hall. So in 1884, Grover Cleveland was the Democratic nominee for president. That year, the young boy from Caldwell became the 22nd president of the United States of America. And he was only 47 years old. He was the second youngest president behind Ulysses S. Grant. At his inaugural, Grover Cleveland said, in the exercise of the people's power and right of self-government, they have committed to one of their fellow citizens a supreme and sacred trust, and he here consecrates himself to their service. Every voter is surely as your chief magistrate under the same high sanction, though in a different sphere, exercises a public trust. Now Grover Cleveland later confided, I know that I am honest and sincere in my desire to do well. But the question is whether I will know enough to accomplish what I desire. 
Now, shortly after taking office, Grover Cleveland was called on to be consoler-in-chief of the nation when Ulysses S. Grant died after a long, painful battle with throat cancer. On October 28, 1886, Grover Cleveland presided over the dedication of the Statue of Liberty. It was a celebration of international friendship and American patriotism. And Grover Cleveland ushered in uh, this monument into America. But the biggest highlight, surely, of Grover Cleveland's first term took place on June 2, 1886. That day, President Grover Cleveland married Frances Folsom. Grover Cleveland was the only president in history to be married in the White House. Now, he wasn't the only bachelor president. James Buchanan was also unmarried when he entered the White House, but James Buchanan didn't marry for the rest of his life. Now, when Grover Cleveland got married, this was a grand event that the whole uh, country was celebrating. And in fact, there was sheet music written just for the occasion. And over here we have an image of the sheet music for Cleveland's Luck and Love Grand March. Now, in 1888, Grover Cleveland was up for re-election. Uh, that year, he took on a Republican and Civil War hero, Benjamin Harrison. Now, Grover Cleveland won the popular vote, but he lost the Electoral College, uh, and therefore lost the presidency to Benjamin Harrison. Now, in fact, he actually lost New Jersey, and if New Jersey had voted for Grover Cleveland, then he would have been president. But... As they were packing up to leave the White House, First Lady Frances Folsom turned to a servant and confidently remarked, We are coming back just four years from today. Or, perhaps to paraphrase Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. And indeed he was. In 1892, Grover Cleveland again ran for president, and for the third consecutive time, Grover Cleveland won the popular vote, and this time, he won the presidency once again, which is the reason that Grover Cleveland is both our 22nd and our 24th president. Now, this term was a little bit rougher than his first term. First, shortly after taking office, Grover Cleveland discovered that he had mouth cancer. Now recall I mentioned uh, uh, Grant's uh, throat cancer, and at the time Grant was the most beloved American, and it was a very painful ordeal for the public. Uh, so Grover Cleveland, Grover the Good, the honest Grover the Cleveland, decided to tell a little fib to the public and not tell them that he was having surgery uh, to remove the cancer. Uh, it's a wonderful story worthy of a presentation on its own. And if you are interested, I recommend picking up this fine book, The President is a Sick Man by Matthew L. Jail. And if you're interested in actually seeing the tumor uh, that was extracted from Grover Cleveland's mouth, you can see that at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Several months later, uh, the, com uh, uh, the country fell into an economic panic known as the Panic of 1893. It was the worst economic calamity that the country had seen up until this point, and it lasted throughout his term. There was widespread labor unrest, such as the Pullman strike in 1894. Uh, uh, in that case, Grover Cleveland decided to send in the military to force the strikers back to work. But it wasn't all bad for Grover Cleveland during his first term. Uh, he dedicated the Columbian Exposition in Chicago that year. Uh, and certainly the high point of Grover Cleveland's second term took place on September 9, 1893, when Francis gave birth to their daughter Esther. Esther became the first child of a president ever born in the White House. So now Grover Cleveland has the fine distinction of being the only president married in the White House and the only president to have a child while serving as president of the White House. So what's Grover Cleveland's legacy as president, as a two-term president? Certainly Grover Cleveland's 
reputation for honesty and anti-corruption was a hallmark of his presidency. So here we have a very interesting image from Pup Magazine where you can see President Grover Cleveland guarding the gates of the White House against uh, Tammany Hall. Uh, Grover Cleveland also restored an energetic presidency. At the time during the Gilded Age, there was more power in the pro-business Congress than there was in the uh, executive office. Now, Grover Cleveland was the only Democratic president to serve between James Buchanan and to Woodrow Wilson. So a span of 52 years, Grover Cleveland was the only Democratic president. And he was the most powerful president between Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. And one of the ways that Grover Cleveland exerted this power was through the presidential veto. At the time, he had more vetoes than any other president in history, 584. Now, the previous record for presidential vetoes was only 93, and that was Ulysses S. Grant. So Grover Cleveland uh, held the record for vetoes until FDR. Uh, so Grover Cleveland's 584 is second in presidential history, FDR is 635, but just remember, uh, that took FDR uh, over 12 years uh, to get that many vetoes. Now, what was Grover Cleveland vetoing? Uh, so many of them were attempts at Congress uh, to pass pension plans uh, for Civil War veterans. Many of these pension plans Grover Cleveland saw as corrupt and as a waste of the people's money. He felt that they were false claims of wartime injuries. And perhaps that's what lost the election for Grover Cleveland in 1888. Certainly that might have been one of the factors. But it's also worth noting that Grover Cleveland approved more pension requests than any other earlier president. Now Grover Cleveland also vetoed bills that he believed made people reliant on the government and he also believed in a very limited role of federal government. So, for instance, there was one bill that would have granted $10,000 in subsidies to Texas farmers that were suffering from a drought. Grover Cleveland vetoed that bill. Now, Grover Cleveland, some might say, can be viewed as a conservationist president. He protected millions of acres of national forests, many of those in California, as well as signed orders to improve the protection for Yellowstone National Park. In Grover Cleveland's first term, he signed legislation to uh, admit four new states into the Union. Those were North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington. And then in 1896, in his second term, Utah joined the Union. But perhaps Grover Cleveland is best known for the state that he didn't admit, and that's Hawaii. At the time, there was pro-business interests that were pushing for the annexation of Hawaii. But Grover Cleveland strongly believed that Hawaii deserved their independence. Uh, in regard to the attempt, Grover Cleveland said, I regard the annexation of Hawaii as not only opposed to our national policy, but as a perversion of our national mission. The mission of our nation is to build up and make a great country out of what we have instead of annexing islands. And to this day, the Hawaiians highly regard Grover Cleveland. Here we have two images. One is of a statue from Buffalo, and you can see it's adorned in Hawaiian lays. The second image there is from Grover Cleveland's grave, and you can see it's adorned in a Hawaiian shell necklace. I've been to the grave many times. It's in Princeton, New Jersey. And every time that I've been there, I've never failed to see Hawaiian beads on the grave. Now, Grover Cleveland didn't choose to be born in New Jersey, but one of the reasons that I believe Grover Cleveland is a New Jersey guy is because Grover Cleveland chose to retire to New Jersey. After leaving office, he retired to Westland Mansion in Princeton, New Jersey. He was right by the university and he was actually neighbors with future president Woodrow Wilson. Now Grover Cleveland became an elder statesman and a beloved figure in Princeton. He lectured at the university. He was on the board of trustees for Princeton University. Students would come visit his home after football games, on his birthdays. In Princeton, Grover Cleveland also uh, continued to enjoy his favorite passion of fishing. And here's a couple of images of Grover Cleveland from his later years fishing. 
and he actually wrote a book about fishing too. Uh, in 1907, on Grover Cleveland's 70th birthday, students from Princeton University paraded to his house just like they did every year on his birthday. And that year they gave Grover Cleveland a gift of a silver loving cup. Grover Cleveland thanked them and said, I feel young at 70 because I have here breathed the atmosphere of vigorous youth. On June 24th, 1808 at 8.40 p.m., Grover Cleveland passed away in his home in Princeton, New Jersey. His final words, I think, are words that truly capture the man and the life that he tried to lead. His final words were, I've tried so hard to do right. Now here we have an image uh, from the newspaper, from uh, a paper in Mississippi, that reads eloquently, Grover Cleveland's spirit wings its flight. Here we have one from Nevada that's a little more blunt. Ex-President Cleveland is summoned by the Grim Reaper. So in Princeton, there was a very brief and very humble funeral held for him. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt traveled to Princeton for the funeral. And there were several tributes given to Grover Cleveland uh, that I'd like to share. Notably, these are tributes from presidents on the other side of the aisle. The first one is from, Pretty, is from President Teddy Roosevelt. Since Grover Cleveland's retirement from the presidency, he has continued to serve his countrymen by the simplicity, dignity, and uprightness of his private life. Now, on the night that Grover Cleveland died, presidential candidate William Howard Taft was delivering a speech at Yale University. So once he learned that President Grover Cleveland had passed away, he gave an impromptu aside during his speech. And he said, Grover Cleveland was a great man and a great president. He had the highest civic ideals, a rugged honesty, and a high courage. These things will now make him happy in death. As Grover Cleveland leaves the world, he is revered, loved, and respected by his countrymen. So Grover Cleveland was uh, buried in Princeton, New Jersey, and this humble marker was placed over his grave. Again, if you look up top, you can see the uh, Hawaiian shells. Now, every year, uh, the military pays honor to Grover Cleveland on his birthday, just like they do for every president on their birthday at their grave. Ever since LBJ, uh, every president has been honored in this fashion. I was lucky enough to visit the ceremony uh, in 2015, and there's an image uh, of the military and local politicians paying their respects. So back to Grover Cleveland's birthplace. Now when Grover Cleveland started his meteoric rise in politics, his uh, people started to take interest in the birthplace. And in 1884, when Grover Cleveland was running for president, uh, a reporter knocked on the door of the birthplace. At the time, the Reverend Charles T. Berry was living in the home. And Barry had lamented to the reporter, I suppose I shall have numerous callers now. After Grover Cleveland became president, uh, he sent a letter uh, to Caldwell, New Jersey, uh, about his birthplace. He said, though I remember almost nothing of the village where I spent a very few early days, I can sincerely say that the spot is dear to me as the place of his birth should be dear to every man. So the birthplace remained in private hands owned by the church until 1913. On February 21st, 1913, the Grover Cleveland Birthplace Memorial Association was formed with the mission to honor and perpetuate the memory of Grover Cleveland. Now on March 18th, the Grover Cleveland Birthplace was open to the public. There was a huge dedication ceremony. It was one of the biggest crowds that had ever gathered in Caldwell to pay tribute to Grover Cleveland. President Woodrow Wilson was invited, but unfortunately he couldn't attend. But he did send a letter, and it reads, I think it must be evident to everyone who has given attention to the matter that the feeling of the country, the feeling alike of admiration and affection towards Mr. Cleveland grows warmer and warmer as the years pass by. As we see him in perspective, he looms as one of our most notable figures in our long line of presidents. 
I send these lines, therefore, as a sincere tribute of respect and admiration. Now, two decades, uh, two decades later, as the country uh, was mired in the Great Depression, the Grover Cleveland Birthplace Memorial Association was struggling to pay the bills to keep up with the home. So, in 1934, the home was turned over to the state of New Jersey. Now, Grover Cleveland's birthplace is a very special place. Of the 44 presidents that have served our country, only five of them were born in the hospital. The other 39, including Grover Cleveland, were born in the home. Now, Grover Cleveland's birthplace is one of only 15 original presidential birthplace homes that is, that is open to the public and still in its original location. Uh, others have been moved over the years. Now, most amazingly of all, Grover Cleveland's birthplace has been open continuously for 107 years. Only two presidential birthplaces can claim that they have been open longer than that. And that is the presidential, uh, presidential birthplace of John Adams and John Quincy Adams in Quincy, Massachusetts. And Grover Cleveland's birthplace is the only site dedicated to Grover Cleveland in all of the United States of America. And that is thanks to two groups of individuals. One I mentioned already, which is the Grover Cleveland Birthplace Memorial Association, which is, uh, is comprised of incredibly dedicated men and women who dedicate their time and efforts uh, to, for the preservation of Grover Cleveland's memory and the preservation of his birthplace. As well, it's thanks to the employees and volunteers of the state of New Jersey and the Grover Cleveland Birthplace State Historic Site that also dedicate so much time and energy towards uh, uh, Grover Cleveland's birthplace and keeping it open to the public. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for listening. I hope you uh, enjoyed my presentation. Before I sign off, I would like to call up my director and my son, uh, Vincent Pacone, who's uh, a media student at Roxbury High School and did a great job on this video. Great job, buddy. Thank you, Dad. So Good long, time. everybody. Thank you.